Hi, I'm Linda Mechner, your host of Why Eating Healthy is Not Enough. I'm here today with Robin Strigley, the hormone diva. And Robin, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about you and what brought you to do this incredible work that you do. Yeah, for sure. Um, my journey to becoming a holistic nutritionist and really focusing on women's health and hormones specifically started with my own issues, to be honest. Um, issues that I didn't realize were issues when they were first happening. But uh, I was in nutrition school and <clears throat> um, I remember we had a guest teacher come in to talk with us about birth control pill. I had been on it for seven years at the time and in none of those seven years and all the different pills that I had gone through, did my doctor ever explain some of the crazy major risks that are involved in using that medication, um, like cancer risk, infertility, um, post pill PCOS, depression, um, liver tumors, blood clots, you name it, right? There's so many different things. And when I learned about this in nutrition school, I was dumbfounded. And that was the last day that I ever took a birth control pill. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, like I've been taking synthetic hormones for a number of years now. Probably things are going to go a little bit cuckoo, you know, when I come off of this. But it was way worse than I ever could have thought. It's what I like to refer to as my second puberty that happened in my early 20s. Uh, when I came off that, I gained a lot of weight. Uh, my skin broke out in horrible acne. I didn't get a period, not even the one you're supposed to get when you finish a pack of pills. That one didn't even come. Uh, my hair started falling out. Um, previous issues that I'd had with anxiety and depression uh, worsened, you know, hundredfold. It was unbelievable. I, I didn't recognize myself. I didn't feel like myself. And so, of course, I went to my doctor. I was like, what's going on here? You know, why, why am I feeling this way? And she was hesitant to say anything at first. And so it took about a, a full year to finally be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. It explained everything that I had been experiencing. It was such a relief to finally have an answer for all the things that were going on with me. However, the doctor, you know, the treatments, all they have is birth control pills. And I didn't want to go back on those. And another drug called metformin, which is typically prescribed for diabetics. It's supposed to help with the blood sugar. And I didn't want to take any medications. And so I knew that decision, but I didn't know where to go from there. And so it was really my journey to reversing all of my PCOS symptoms naturally and seeing that it was possible in the first place and how much I could really thrive by doing it. That kind of led me in this direction to where I help women do the same, not just with PCOS, but with all kinds of hormonal issues now. Wow. What an incredible story. I mean, it just... You know, I think back at my own journey of taking medications that I didn't understand the ramifications of. Not that one, thank goodness. But, you know, we do so much damage, even though we're just following our doctor's advice. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting about PCOS is that it's so closely linked to metabolic syndrome, which is sort of the same paradigm that leads people into you know, pre-diabetes and then diabetes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how blood sugar and PCOS are connected. Yeah, for sure. That's a, a fabulous question. And you're totally right. PCOS increased, increases risks for so many different things later on in life. Many women end up having metabolic syndrome and PCOS together. And it really all comes down to um, blood sugar and insulin response in the body and whether that's working properly or not. And so insulin is our blood sugar regulating hormone. It's supposed to help uh, sugar that from the food that we eat, totally a normal response at this point to get into our cells to make energy and so our cells can function. Um, and that's a really important thing to happen in the body. However, when it comes to PCOS uh, and similar conditions, uh, our bodies become desensitized to insulin. So basically what this means is um, when insulin is carrying or shuttling the sugar over to our cells, it's supposed to have a key to unlock those cell doors so the sugar can get in. But when we're desensitized, it's like our cells have changed the locks. And so the key that insulin has does not work anymore. 
So insulin can't do its job. So sugar's not getting into the cells. And basically what's happening is you end up with higher levels of blood sugar. You end up with higher levels of insulin floating around. And this is where the problems really begin. Um, when insulin is out of balance, it miscommunicates with the ovaries. And so women with PCOS will often end up with absent periods or irregular periods, uh, fertility struggles, that type of thing, because insulin is messing with our ovaries. And also this blood sugar issue in women with PCOS also often leads to weight gain. About 50% of women are with PCOS are overweight. Um, and it's really important to realize that, you know, no amount of just cutting calories or whatever is really going to help this issue. You have to get insulin under control so that it's not constantly storing fat on the body. So those are kind of the two main ways insulin and blood sugar are playing into uh, PCOS. Right. And it seems like a double whammy because it, there's something about PCOS that makes people want, like want and crave those carbohydrates more right? So, I mean, not only is it not actually getting into your cells, but you actually crave it. And so it's like this vicious cycle that it just seems like it would be so difficult to break through it. But maybe, maybe talk a little bit about how you start to change that metabolic syndrome and shift out of PCOS, just to help people understand, you know, how it, how you can flip it. For sure. Absolutely. And there's lots of different ways to do this. Obviously, there's the medical route, you know, the metformin and stuff like that. But if we're talking about natural interventions, the single best thing that you can do for your blood sugar is to uh, have a good diet, eat well. Um, and this is different for every person. But uh, I mentioned previously, you know, it's not all about calories in versus calories out when it comes to balancing blood sugar, balancing hormones. Um, because you can eat, you know, 1200 calories a day, let's say, which is crazy low for pretty much anybody, but just sorry, we had a little glitch there. So the last thing I heard was it's not all about calories in versus calories out. Right. And this is something that, uh, can be hard to wrap our minds around, um, when that's basically what we're taught when it comes to health and diet and stuff like that. But for example, like you can eat the same amount of calories in a day, let's say 1200 calories of like 100 calorie snack packs of low fat yogurt of uh plain salads with you know plain grilled chicken whatever and you can say yeah okay i'm eating you know pretty clean i'm eating low calorie i should be feeling better versus eating the same amount of calories let's say 1200 again and you're having tons of high fiber fiber vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and asparagus and you're having uh, you know, salmon and shrimp and uh, hemp seeds and chia seeds, and you're just packing yourself full of nutrition for the same amount of calories, you're going to see much better results than simply by counting calories alone. And this is a really important piece when it comes to regulating blood sugar, insulin, and of course, helping with PCOS, um, because we need to get as much nutrition that's going to help balance our blood sugar that's going to help reduce the inflammation that's contributing to the insulin issues. Uh, and you're not going to get that simply by counting calories. It's really more about nutrient density and making sure you're getting the most bang for your buck when the foods you're choosing to eat. Yeah, that's such, that's such good advice. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned about PCOS that I thought was really, really interesting, and I, 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 I want to learn more about it, is that for for some people, PCOS starts before they're even born. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think sometimes people feel like responsible for whatever is going on in their health. But I think it's really important to understand that sometimes the seeds are sown in your genetics, in your, you know, in, in utero. It, it's not all about, you know, it's, you know, our health conditions are not a censure of our lifestyle, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Honestly, it's really a combination of both. Um, in PCOS specifically, there is some research that it can be hereditary. So a lot of times moms uh, will give birth and their daughters might have PCOS when they get, you know, to puberty and it'll all start developing. Um, and a lot of times because 
PCOS, as it's called, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is relatively new. You know, moms and grandmothers might have had symptoms, but not necessarily been diagnosed with, you know, PCOS, because it really wasn't called that back then. It really wasn't known what was happening. Um, and so I hear that a lot with my clients. I'll, I'll ask them and they'll say, oh, yeah, well, my mom has this, this, this symptom, just like I do, but she was never diagnosed. Uh, or they'll say, well, my sister has it too, and that kind of thing. So there's definitely a genetic component, but I don't like people to kind of use that as a crutch because we have a lot of power over how our genes are expressed. So it, yeah. yes, you might be predisposed to having this. Yes, you know, different factors with your genes, with your metabolism um, might play into having PCOS and how that manifests for you in terms of signs and symptoms but you have massive control over how that's going to be reflected in the rest of your life, right? You, you don't have to feel at the mercy of your genes. So it's a little bit of both for sure. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, and that's such a, an important point too. It's like, yes, we get dealt the hand we get, but you know, at the same time, we also, you know, how we play that hand is really up to us. And tell me, what is a lack trap? Uh, this is something that I hear really often from the women that I work with uh, who have PCOS. You know, I hear statements like, um, what are other ways I can lose weight? I've already cut out dairy and gluten and the scale isn't moving. Or they'll tell me, you know, uh, I've gone keto, I've cut out sugar, I've cut out carbs, but I still haven't gotten a period. What am I doing wrong? Or maybe... Um, I eat healthier than everyone I know. I don't do sugar. I don't sit on my butt all day, you know, and nothing is working. What can I do? You know, they feel like I'm getting rid of all the bad stuff. I'm not doing the things that I'm, I shouldn't be doing. You know, why am I still suffering? And so this type of thinking is what I like to call the lack trap. Um, thinking that by removing or eliminating foods, activities, and other things from your life that you're going to feel better and get control of PCOS, right? This is what's keeping you stuck. It's keeping your mind, um, your body in a state of negativity, in a state of can't, uh, shouldn't, those types of things. And so we get a lot of anxiety, confusion, and really ultimately disappointment and discouragement because we don't see the results what we, that we want to. And so we become really hard on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We say and think and feel negative things about ourselves. That mindset isn't conducive to healing. It doesn't open you up to allow for physical and mental and emotional well-being uh, as well. Rather, it's important to take an approach not from an area of lack, but one of abundance. Look at all the things that you can eat. Look at all the things that you can do. Improve that you know, variety in your life so that you're feeling like you're including a lot of really good things, like we were talking about before, that nutrient density, right? It's not just about right. what you eliminate from your diet. It's about what you include in your diet. Right, right. Yeah, so true. And so just to help people identify what the signs and symptoms might be in their own body if they're experiencing this? What are some of the most common typical signs and symptoms that somebody might look at to say, oh yeah, maybe that's why, you know, this seems so impossible to me? For sure. So in getting a diagnosis for PCOS, you need two out of three criteria that they use. The first one is cysts on the ovaries. So you're not really going to know that unless your doctor is doing an ultrasound. Um, and typically it's other symptoms that will bring you into the doctor that will make them do the ultrasound in the first place. Um, the second thing is uh, irregular or absent menstrual cycles. This is a huge, huge one. So I know women with PCOS who have gone a year, two years or more without a period, or they'll go a few months without a period and it's never predictable. They never know when it's going to come. It impacts all different things areas of their lives, not just their ability to conceive, because not everyone's, you know, trying to have a family when they find out they have PCOS, although that's pretty common as well. Um, so the period issues. And on the other hand, there's a lot of women with PCOS who are bleeding constantly. So I had a client once who was bleeding for 60 days straight, two months straight, she'd have about a week break and it would repeat on that cycle. Um, and just like the women who are having no bleeding, right? There's no ovulation happening. There's no real cycle happening there in that 
uh, regard either. And then the third criteria is either um, elevated androgen hormones like testosterone on blood work and or symptoms of that. And so this is where the majority of, of PCOS symptoms come from. Um, the weight gain, as I mentioned, is about 50% of women, although there's lots of lean women with PCOS. Um, facial and body hair growth, uh, mm -hmm. hair loss from the head, it's called androgenic alopecia, especially sort of around the, the front hairline area. Um, acne, that's a big one. I struggled mm -hmm. with that um, a ton, a ton when I was going through the worst of my PCOS. Um, and some women even find that this affects like their libido. So they'll have almost no libido or it'll be really, really high depending on where their hormones are. Um, and all of these things combined, the periods, the weight, the physical stuff, right? It's really not good for our confidence when our hair is falling out and we're growing a beard and we've got spots all over our face and stuff like that. So those are kind of the main ones. There's also uh, a high amount of women with PCOS who have mood issues too, mm -hmm. anxiety and stuff. And I think it's probably both from having to deal with all of those issues and also because the hormones are causing us to feel that way. Wow. Yeah. It's, I, you know, when, when I hear about it, it's like, yes, I see that all around me, but yeah. you know, when I was in nutrition school, what was it like 13, 14 years ago, you know, I don't remember PCOS being mentioned even one time, you know, the signs and symptoms it just wasn't in my radar until much more recently. And I was just at a symposium this past spring and there were a lot of OBGYNs, a lot of women's doctors there. And one of the OBGYNs stood up and said, you know, years ago when they first started their practice, they would see a few cases of PCOS per year. Mm -hmm. And now it's more like they will see a few cases per week, mm -hmm. which in terms of, you know, major shifts in health, that's so profound. And I think it's, you know, it's the same way with diabetes. Diabetes used to be a very rare condition. And now every other person has diabetes or prediabetes. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about PCOS, but I'd love for you to touch on maybe some issues around fertility and people who are struggling to conceive, because that's also, you know, it seems like it's getting harder and harder for people just to conceive naturally. I mean, you know, people used to just have babies with no problem. And now it seems like having a baby is a very expensive medical proposition. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And a lot of times it doesn't have to be. It's just like, with PCOS or any other kind of women's health issue, right? All the doctors know, all they're trained to do is diagnose and prescribe the proper medication um, or, you know, surgeries and things like this. And the same is with fertility, right? If they don't know why you're having trouble, or maybe they do because you have PCOS or endometriosis or something like this, all they have is their medications. That's what's in their wheelhouse. And that's fine, but there's a lot of things that can be done prior to um, resorting to that. Because as you said, it can be very, very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars, and no guarantee that any of those things are going to work, unfortunately. And I see it often in my practice. Women will come and they'll be on, you know, medications to ovulate or different things, and uh, they it either doesn't work or it causes horrible side effects, um, or they get pregnant and they miscarry, different things like this. And so when it comes to fertility, yes, 100% seeing your doctor is important because they can do testing, right? They can figure out why that's happening. Is it you? Is it your partner? Is it both of you? Does it have to do with ovulation issues? Um, does it have to do with uh, the health of your uterine lining? Do you have cysts in the way? You know, what's going on? What's the underlying reason um, for this? And I have a, a new client. I was just speaking with her um, prior to us recording this, actually. And she's got a pituitary tumor that's causing her to not have um, ovulatory cycles. So there's very, very many different factors. So number one, definitely getting that checked out. And number two, going back to what we've just kind of been talking a lot about, which is nutrient density. Where, what are you eating on a daily basis? 
Is it low calorie? That doesn't matter. You know, are you getting right. enough vitamins and minerals? Are you getting enough, you know, um, phytochemicals, anti-inflammatory compounds, you know, all of these things. And there's tons of specific foods um, for fertility in particular, for women and specifically for men as well, if your partner is the one with the issues. Um, so those are kind of the two key areas to really dive deep into, right? Figure out why. Mm -hmm. Find someone who will do the testing. I know it can be really tough to, to get do <laughs> doctors to be on our side sometimes when it comes to that, but be your own advocate and then increase your nutrient density. Find the foods that are going to help support your specific fertility issue. Mm -hmm. So what are some foods like that you find particularly helpful in general? I mean, obviously you can't speak to all, you know, all reasons, right? But what are some foods that are really helpful? Uh, there's a category of foods, or I guess two categories, one called phytoestrogens, and the other one is, is phytoprogesterones. Um, and so these are foods that can help to modulate either estrogen or progesterone. And having these foods in your regular rotation is going to mean regular menstrual cycles with healthy ovulation. It's going to mean better egg quality for you. And it's going to mean that when you do get pregnant, you stay pregnant and you're reducing your risk of miscarriage. Um, so for example, there are certain seeds that help with this. You can Google seed cycling and find loads of different um, free articles on how to do this. But basically, you're eating certain foods to help boost progesterone at a certain time in your cycle. For example, flax seeds. These are a big one. Love them for hormonal health. And then certain seeds at a different time in your cycle to help boost progesterone. Um, for example, sunflower and sesame seeds. And you can rotate these through your diet at certain times. Again, just Google it. It's really, really easy to do. Um, and you'll boost these specific hormones, giving your body the nutrients it needs. And it's a really simple way. It's not crazy, you know, expensive supplements. It's not toxic medications. It's just seeds, right? Just including those kind of things is really helpful. Right. You know, I just love that. And, you know, it's one of the things that I love about nutrition is that really the fundamentals of health, no matter how complicated and overwhelming a health condition might be a lot of times the answers are just in food like the food choices we make throughout the day throughout the weeks throughout the months and you know knowledge is power mm -hmm. potential power <laughs> yes yes you have to use that power right right you actually have to put it into action yes so um i know you have a free gift for our listeners maybe you could tell us a little bit about that Sure, sure. So I've created the ultimate PCOS checklist. And what I've included here is pretty much everything that you need to be successful in managing your PCOS from um, a big list. I think I put in 20 different superfoods to help with PCOS. And by superfoods, I don't mean expensive powders from the health food store. I mean like foods from your grocery store that have superpowers when it comes to nutrition and health. Um, for example, avocados, one of my favorites for women's health in general. Um, the second thing that I've included in there is uh, my five favorite supplements for PCOS, why you'd use them and how to use them with brand recommendations. And I've included my favorite uh, tools to help with some of the uh, physical aspects of PCOS. So things you can do to help with hair loss, with excess hair growth, with acne on the skin and that type of thing. So you're really getting an inside out approach with this checklist and it's awesome. It's just packed full of good stuff to get you started. Sounds amazing. I am definitely going to download that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it just sounds like a must have for anybody who is dealing with PCS, the PCOS anybody who thinks they might be dealing with PCOS. Yes. Um, so thank you so incredibly much for sharing your wisdom today. I found this so valuable and hopefully our listeners did too. And um, yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. We're definitely going to stay connected. I think I have some referrals for you and I will see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. I'll see you in, on the next slide.